Hello there, everyone. Today, I am going to finish up with our lesson from the other day on population growth. We left off talking about how to calculate um, the current population size and kind of use a couple different models to predict what the population size is going to be into the future. Today, we are going to add on to that, adding a few more parameters that essentially allow our estimates to be a little bit more realistic. That is, we're talking about limits. In our last class together, we were talking about an example of a population of 100 tigers. We started off with this population, so n0, n being the population size, 0 being the beginning of our measurements. Um, so 100 tigers, and we ultimately used an equation that looks like this, the initial um, population size plus the number of births as calculated by the birth rate times the initial population. And we took away the number of deaths. So the mortality rate times again, the same initial number in the population. Um, and ultimately if we did that, we came up with 130 tigers existing um, or living within the next year. Um, we can continue to do this um, using the same kind of a calculation. Um, instead of N0, we would then use N1. So 130 tigers plus the number of births minus the number of deaths gave us 169 tigers. I do want to give an alternate um, uh, equation for this calculation, one that is used um, in a lot of other uh, contexts as well. And so you might see this one come up and I want you to know um, just how to use it. Um, so uh, essentially this can be rewritten as um, T plus one. So the size of the population at an initial year. So for example, N plus one. So if we want to know at about a hundred, if we want to know the population size at N2, we can say N1 plus two, you know, plus one would give us that N2 equals lambda times the size of the previous year's population. Okay, now lambda, um, what this actually means, um, this is essentially what's called the finite rate of increase within the population. So finite rate of increase within the population. So essentially that is um, uh, more or less expressed as a ratio, the population of N2, right? The uh, second year over the population of the previous year. And so that essentially gives us, um, you know, gives us an idea of how much the population is increasing over the course of a year. Now to calculate this, we can use one plus the rate. Okay, now we haven't talked about um, the per capita growth rate yet, um, but R, this is per capita growth rate. Okay, so for every individual organism within the population, so for every individual tiger, this is the rate at which, um, you know, this is how many organisms they are going to contribute to the population in the next year. Um, so um, R can be calculated um, either as the birth rate minus the death rate, okay, or um, the, of course, there's a lot of different ways of going about this. I'm just going to throw a lot of different things at you so that you um, have a lot of options. Whatever one works for you, that is great. Um, so you can also use the change in number, right? So 130 minus 100 over the change in time, okay? Over this year's population or over the initial population. Okay, so um, whichever one of these works, um, I'm assuming that this one um, will be the easier one for you to use. Okay, so um, essentially what we can do here um, is we can calculate the birth rate minus the death rate. Okay, so for our tiger population, our birth rate was 0.4 minus our death rate which was 0.1, okay? And that would give us R, right? So the ultimate per capita growth rate for this particular population of tigers is going to be 
Um, lambda, however, is one plus 0.3. Okay, so for lambda for this particular population is 1.3. And so when we multiply 1.3 times whatever population we're concerned with, so for example, by 130, what we would get is actually 169. Okay, so I wanted to uh, show you that to make sure that um, if you see lambda coming up um, in your textbook or in other sources, that is what that is. Also, you could use this to calculate um, populations in, um, in class. To get a good idea of the trend in population growth, we can, of course, graph the information that we have calculated so far. Um, we know that year zero, so time zero, we had 100 tigers in this hypothetical population. In year one, we calculated that the population would increase to 130 tigers. In year two, it would increase to 169. Okay. Now, the problem with this calculation is that it is what's called discrete. So essentially what it's saying is that for this entire year, the population of tigers is 100. Okay? And then all of a sudden, at the turn of the next year, the population increases to 130. And then finally, the population increases to 169 at the turn of the third year. Okay, so essentially, this is saying that the population increases all at one particular time, not continuously over the course of the year. And so um, there are weaknesses, of course, to this model. Um, first of all, you can only predict population sizes in these discrete intervals. So at this particular junction point, because this type of very simplistic model assumes that the population is changing at a very particular time. Now, tigers do have distinct breeding seasons. Okay? So they do um, keep a pretty consistent population for a while, and then all of the organisms are going to breed at about the same time. And so um, organisms with distinct breeding seasons, things like tigers, things like annual plants, you can actually use this simplistic discrete model of population growth. However, most organisms, um, and in reality, even to an extent, tigers, um, they or their population change in a more continuous way. Okay, so we can of course add a slope here. Okay, and we can more or less extrapolate what the population would be halfway through the year, but that is not um, really covered right, by this particular type of model. So what we can do is we can essentially break our timeline into smaller and smaller intervals, right? So if I just draw time, right, as an actual timeline here, in the model that we have done so far, we have, you know, measured uh, tiger populations at these distinct one-year intervals. Now, if we wanted to be a little bit more specific, maybe we could measure the populations a couple times a year, right? or we can measure them many times a year, as many as possible. Now, obviously this is unrealistic to just keep on measuring over and over again, but um, we can use math, specifically calculus, to essentially put these points so close together that ultimately we have so many um, smaller and smaller time intervals that we more or less produce this smooth curve. Okay, so this actually becomes much more accurate for um, the majority of organisms, with the few exceptions of those that have um, very discrete breeding seasons. Okay, so essentially, as time, as these time intervals approach zero, the growth rate that we can calculate and the actual uh, population size um, becomes what is called instantaneous. Okay? And so this math that we have been using so far is discrete, okay? sometimes called geometric. But what we are about to talk about now is called continuous. 
continuous. Um, and so we can use this calculation method um, to look at how the growth rate actually changes at different points in time. To elaborate just a little bit more, discrete growth is what we have been looking at so far. It, um, the assumptions are that these changes in population size happen at specific intervals. Um, for the most part, this is pretty unrealistic, but there are certain limited circumstances in which we can actually use this more simplistic model, um, specifically organisms with non-overlapping generations. So annual plants, for example, you plant your begonias in um, the early summertime, right? And then they're going to completely die off by the end of the season, right? And so the next population is, um, is an entirely separate entity, right? So the population size is going to be um, stopped, right? At the end of that season. Um, also, there are certain organisms that have um, kind of pulsed or seasonal reproduction. A lot of insects, of course, are only um, alive, mobile in the summertime. And then in the wintertime, um, their population isn't changing at all. Okay. Continuous growth, on the other hand, um, assumes that change can happen at every instant. Um, this is appropriate for organisms with overlapping generations. So like humans, we have overlapping generations. There's not one time for breeding and then, you know, you have to wait until the next time for breeding. Um, we uh, have these overlapping um, cohorts within our population. Um, so this would um, also include perennial plants. Okay, so last year's population is still doing its thing when this year's population um, begins to grow. Um, also, any kind of um, microorganisms grown in culture. Okay, so even if it's not a seasonal environment, we can assume that there is continuous growth within, um, within this environment. Um, so what exactly does this look like? I showed you um, in my drawing what this discrete uh, graph of population growth would look like. Um, so what we can see here is a continuous exponential growth in population. So what we see in the beginning here um, is initial population size of 2000, right? But as we um, increase the time, right? So as we move along in time, we can see that um, one year's population doesn't end, and then all of a sudden a big jump up in the next year's population, it is continuous. Um, also, because of this, we get this exponential increase in the number of organisms in the population. Okay. Um, if we were to look at essentially the slope, okay, so the change, the rate of change in the population itself, what that would look like is this. Okay, so um, in the equations I'm about to show you, um, we are going to be calculating DNDT. And essentially this is um, uh, expressing the population growth rate. So how quickly is the population increasing? And as we can see by this really steep slope right here, the rate of increase is actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, so over time, the population growth rate, the size of the change itself, the speed with which more babies are born, is going to increase in this linear fashion. Okay. Um, we can see the number of individuals in the population. We can see the DNDT, so the number of individuals added to the population in a specific time interval. What we have seen before is discrete population growth. This equation is really important for calculating discrete population growth, as well as the equations that we talked about the other day in class. Now we are going to look at the equations necessary to analyze continuous growth. Okay. So if we want to predict the population size for any time, right, as opposed to just at these distinct intervals, um, we use this differential equation. 
Um, it is not critically important to understand the calculus behind all of this. In fact, I am not even going to go into that with you. Um, you simply need to know how to use these equations and a little bit about what they actually mean. Okay, so this here um, is said dn dt. Um, it is essentially um, the derivative of n, the population size, with respect to time. Okay. It is an instantaneous rate of change. So essentially it is um, a single moment in time anywhere along this time continuum. In order to calculate it, we use the rate. Okay. So we calculated the rate up here. Um, you generally see R sub max. So this is the maximum growth rate at any given point um, in a particular population and multiply that by n, so the size of a population, okay? This, um, this value here, we call the population growth rate. Right? And generally it is expressed as number of individuals that are added to the population within a particular time frame, a pre-established time frame. Okay. So we can use that. Um, there's another form of this equation that we can use as well. Um, again, the calculus behind this is not critically important, but when this equation is integrated, we can predict the size of a population at a determined time, right? Whatever time we want by multiplying the initial population size times the natural log to the rate, right? So R max times the time. Okay, so we're gonna look at uh, using this here in just a moment, so don't be alarmed yet. Um, this E, um, if you don't remember, this is um, this is a constant, right? And what that constant is is about two point seven one eight. Okay. So far, we can answer questions like this. First of all, we can answer what is the population size going to be in ten years. Okay, so T would be 10 in that situation. So what is the population going to be in 10 years? We can answer how many more individuals are going to be added to the population this year. Okay, so what is the population growth rate now? We can also rearrange this integrated expression here to figure out how long will it take to double the population size. Okay, for example, so how long would it take to double the population? Um, and so essentially what that is, is um, two times whatever, you know, the current population is. Okay. And so if we rearrange that, and again, you do not have to um, know how to uh, calculate, you know, to convert these equations like this, but long story short, we have T double. So um, how much time would it take to double the population? Right, and log of two over R. Right, again, R we've calculated up here. Okay, we could do the same thing if we wanted to triple the population, right? So that would be three N, right? And instead of um, natural log of two, it would be of three. In your notes, I have given an example problem about mice. Um, in this mouse example, right, so I'll just write example. Um, the mouse information that I gave you guys. Okay, in this population, I tell you that we start out with a population of 2,000 mice. So that is the beginning population. Um, I tell you that there are a thousand new mice. Okay, so we can calculate B, the birth rate, 
by using the number of births, a thousand new mice, a right? thousand births, <laughs> mice, not nice, um, over the initial population. So that'd be 2000 original mice. All right, and so the birth rate would be 0 0.5. Okay. We can do the same with mortality rate. I tell you that 200 of these individuals die um, at the end of the month um, that was measured. Okay. So the number of deaths over the total original population, be 200 are going to die over 2,000 original. And so that leaves us with 0.1 as the mortality rate. Okay. I told you up here that the that r is birth rate minus mortality rate okay so the growth rate per capita growth rate that is is b minus m or 0 0.05 minus or 0.5 minus 0.1 for a total of 0.4 and okay, so that is the per capita, per capita growth rate. Okay. How long would it take to double this population? Okay, we can use this equation up here. Okay, so what is the time that we want, or what is the time it would take to double the population over? the growth rate. Okay, and so if you type that into the calculator, you will get 1.73. Um, and this is months, right? Mice reproduce super quickly. Okay, so very little time to double the population. Okay, what about next year, right? So 12 months from now, if there aren't any kinds of limitations, if this population continues to grow at this per capita growth rate, what is the population size going to be? For this, we would use N12, that's what we are interested in. And the equation that we would use to predict this population is this one right here. Okay, mice are continually breeding. It's not like they all breed on the same day. They are very opportunistic when it comes to breeding. Okay, so what's the population going to be in 12 months? Yeah. Initial population is 2,000 mice times E to the 0 0.04 is the growth rate per capita growth rate, that is. And time is the number of months, so 12 months. Okay, so once again, if you type this into the calculator, um, you will get a ridiculous number of mice, 2430200.8 mice. Now, of course, if we're talking about individuals, you want to round, um, generally, um, you know, use 0.5 as a cutoff. So this would be 243,021 mice. To summarize the equations so far that are important in this continuous exponential model, All right? So exponential are this one, which tells us the population growth rate. This one, which helps us to predict the population size at a particular time. And if we rearrange that, we can figure out how long, what time, how long it would take to double or triple or quadruple or whatever the population size. All of these should be um, familiar to you to do some calculations on an upcoming exam. So let's look at an example of real life exponential growth. In this um, slide, what we can see is some population data taken from the Serengeti National Park, which spans the, uh, the borders between 
um, Tanzania and Kenya. Um, so here is Serengeti National Park. Um, in the late 1950s, um, a scientist from the University of Minnesota started uh, monitoring wildebeest populations, and so that's a wildebeest down there at the bottom, um, as well as wild buffalo populations within this park. Um, and initially, the populations were pretty low. Right? So we're talking like less than 200,000 of these individuals. Um, he wanted to know why the populations were so low, and it turns out that they um, were, their population was being limited by a virus. Uh, specifically, this is called the Rinderpest virus. It is actually um, transmitted and very prevalent within cattle populations. And so every once in a while, there is a huge um, wave of this virus that decimates both the cattle populations and, of course, the wild um, populations nearby. Um, in about 1960, a vaccine was developed against this virus. And so cattle within this region of Africa were inoculated with the, with the vaccine. And ultimately the virus was eradicated from the entire population. Um, within a few years, we saw the same trend um, even without the vaccine um, in the wild populations. And so this just goes to show um, how critical it is to get, um, uh, herd immunity, right? quite literally herd immunity. Um, and so even if the virus was still within the population, which of course it was within these wild animals, um, the levels would be low enough right? with so many individuals um, having immunity that the virus um, can't be transmitted um, frequently from individual to individual. And ultimately it is going to die out or become increasingly less prevalent. Um, and so, when we take a look at this graph here, um, all right, so this graph right here, um, what we can see is um, a fairly low wildebeest population before the vaccine, okay? And once the vaccine was, um, was administered to the, uh, the cattle, what we see is the number of infected wildebeest, so these are infected wildebeest, well, white squares, the, that prevalence is going to decline dramatically and it's more or less eliminated by the mid 1960s. Um, simultaneously, we see a drastic increase in the population of the healthy non-infected wildebeest. Okay, uh, so this shape of this curve is showing us exponential growth. So these individuals uh, or this population has increased from about 200,000 to over 1.3 million individuals. Okay, so dramatic increase um, in population when there wasn't this limiting factor, right? This uh, virus within the population. Um, I also want to point out that um, these animals um, are of a subpopulation that is actually migratory. And so that's what's happening up here. Um, essentially, these organisms are going to follow um, the follow available food. Um, so depending on the different uh, wet or dry seasons, they have um, different types of food available to them. And so literally they are going to move hundreds, thousands of miles just to follow the availability of these different um, food sources. Now, this is not without a cost. Um, there are still a lot of um, risks and a lot of um, other uh, challenges that are kind of limiting this population. Um, for example, just across these rivers here, they are risking um, predation, right? Because these are filled with crocodiles. Um, and so a wildebeest can be very tasty to said crocodiles. So um, there must be a very, um, strong selective pressure on them if they're willing to risk predation um, in order to migrate in this kind of circular pattern. Okay. Now, with the mice <laughs> that we just did an example of, as well as with these wildebeests in real life, exponential growth can only last so long, and this probably um, is inherently logical to you. Um, you can only increase the population so much before you start running out of stuff to eat, before you're running out of places to live, 
and many other things. So no population is able to grow indefinitely. So what we can see here is that something else is going on, right, in the mid to late 70s through the end of this particular study, which is in about 2003. Okay, and so um, a lot of these things we have more or less touched upon throughout the semester, but um, let's add some names to them now. Um, populations are regulated via interspecific regulation. Um, so interspecific, you can think of an interstate highway as going from state to state, so multiple states. Interspecific is going from species to species. Uh, now this is a concept that we are going to dig in, uh, dig into in our community talks in the next section of this class. Um, but for now, um, I think we can understand just that there are multiple species um, that are interacting with one another. And those interactions can enhance a population or they can decimate a population size. Um, and so generally these types of interspecific um, regul regulatory mechanisms can be classified as either top down or bottom up. Um, on the very first day of class, we watched a video about salt marsh um, ecosystems and how they can be regulated from the top down or from the bottom up, right? And so we talked about the blue crabs, we talked about the snails, we talked about the salt marsh grasses, okay? Um, and so ultimately they learned it was top down control, which is essentially um, the predators, right, can influence the number of their prey, okay? Which, you know, depending on how many trophic levels there are, can influence um, you know, the primary consumers and therefore um, the number of primary producers. Okay, so in this example right here, um, overfishing reduces the number of predators in the ecosystem here. A reduction in predators is going to allow the um, kind of middle of the road, middle of the trophic um, levels here. Um, to increase in abundance, right? Because they're no longer being predated upon quite as much. Um, an increase in forage fish means that there is going to be less zooplankton available. Um, so zooplankton levels are going to go down, okay? And with less, with fewer zooplankton to eat the phytoplankton, phytoplankton can then increase, right? And so we can see many different um, effects along the, um, ecological hierarchy here, um, and all of it is triggered by these predators. Okay. On the other hand, we have bottom-up regulation. Um, so here, a primary producer, a land plant, phytoplankton, whatever, um, is increased or decreased, and this is going to affect every trophic level um, from there on up. Um, so here, um, if there isn't enough or if there aren't enough nutrients available to the plants, the plants can't grow properly and they're not going to have as much biomass. If there's not enough plants to eat, there might be fewer snails, right? Fewer snails means that the frogs are going to have less to eat. So there's not going to be as many frogs. And if there aren't that many frogs, there are going to be um, fewer predators that would eat said frogs, okay? So generally we can classify um, these mechanisms as top down, Right, so someone higher up the food chain versus bottom up, so going from the primary producers on up um, the trophic levels. Okay, so what is limiting the wildebeest? Okay, for a moment, let's watch this short clip about um, the research that went into figuring out whether the wildebeest was being regulated by top down or bottom up factors. For three years, they recorded not less than 300 carcasses. In the early years, I would see you know, this type of kills. And uh, normally I would think, well, for sure, uh, you know, predators, given their numbers, they will be regulating the wildebeest population. Um, so that was my, my first thought. But after three years of studying, you look at the data, and uh, to my surprise, that was not the case. During the wet season, uh, when there's lots of food to eat, there were very few deaths, which we recorded. And uh, when you look at the bone marrow, it was solid, uh, fatty, and whitish, indicating that the animals died in good health. 
But then uh, during the dry season, we recorded more deaths and uh, animals were in poor condition with their bone marrow being translucent and gelatinous. This research tells us that wildebeest are regulated by availability of food. During the dry season, there is much less food resource for the animals to feed on, and uh, that regulates the wildebeest population. How does food regulate the population? It depends on the density of wildebeest, the number of animals in the ecosystem. After rinderpest was removed, there were very few wildebeest, and food was in superabundance. So the population responded by increasing. It grew exponentially, and as the population was increasing, the amount of food available per individual was becoming less and less and less, until they reached a peak in the year 1977. The population stopped growing when the food available in the dry season couldn't sustain any more animals. The maximum population that can be supported in an ecosystem is called the carrying capacity. For wildebeest in the Serengeti, the carrying capacity is roughly 1.3 million animals. So in that clip, we heard the scientists talking about density dependent regulation, implying that there's a difference between um, regulatory mechanisms that are dependent upon how big the population is and mechanisms that have nothing to do with that. So before we get into all of the um, diverse density dependent mechanisms, let me just make a brief side note about density independent regulation. Um, essentially, these are more of the abiotic factors um, that are affecting population sizes completely um, independent from what the population size is. Okay. Uh, so um, essentially, these are things like temperature, precipitation, any kind of um, natural disaster, right? like a fire, a flood, a drought, a volcano, um, anything like that is going to kill um, off individuals or even promote their existence, um, regardless of how many are already in existence. Um, so we can see here um, in this graph is uh, here we have temperature and here we have intrinsic rate of increase. So here um, R, the per capita growth rate. Um, and so we can see that the growth rate is enhanced. It is increased um, until we reach this optimal temperature. Okay, and then anything above that um, is actually going to make it more difficult for these particular insects to reproduce, make more of the cells to survive. Um, anything, of course, much colder than that is also going to make it very difficult for them to survive. And so this um, has nothing to do with how many individuals are already in the population. Each one is going to be affected by this. And we can see um, that this kind of looks like a zone of tolerance graph, and that is very much the case. Um, essentially, the um, average zone of tolerance, um, you know, if the conditions are within that, then the population growth is going to be much higher. If the conditions are outside of that optimal zone within the zone of tolerance, then um, the population growth is going to be reduced. Um, and so these density independent factors can influence birth rate and death rate, right, per capita birth and death, um, but they're not directly actively regulating population growth, okay? The only things that really are, are the density dependent factors, okay? Um, so again, uh, if abiotic conditions fall outside of the zone of tolerance, it can affect population sizes um, by um, indirectly affecting them in terms of growth, maybe changing um, how long the individual has to wait in order to reproduce, therefore how many individuals they can produce over the course of their lifetime, whether or not they're able to survive, um, whether or not they're able to migrate, etc. Um, and so if conditions fall very much outside of that optimal zone, the zone of tolerance, then populations can ultimately, ultimately go extinct. 
Okay. Um, what we're going to focus the most on is um, density dependent regulations. And so this is, or all of these density dependent factors um, are considered to be intraspecific. Okay, so intraspecific meaning inside a single population. Um, and so the more individuals there are within said population, the resource availability per capita is going to decrease, just like that short um, clip stated. Okay, so you can think of this as um, right, like a pizza right here are eight slices to a pizza. If there's only one person, hooray, that one person gets eight pieces of pizza. If there are two people, each person can get four slices. Right? If there are eight people, each person can get one slice each. And then if you have more than eight people, then things get a little bit tricky, right? So there is a limited amount of resources, right? Unlike um, the examples that I've shown um, so far where we see this exponential growth, um, there's a limit to the number of resources, right? There's only a certain number of pieces of pizza. And so if the population keeps going up and up and up, then the number of resources per individual is going to decline. And so eventually, um, once you have eight people, right, then um, this is going to regulate population growth. It's going to affect how many people are at your party, right? If you don't have enough pizza to go around. Okay, so all of these factors are happening within one species, right, within just your friends of the party, um, or within the wildebeest population, right, within the tiger population, okay, and all of them um, are affected by the size of the population. Okay, so um, just like with the pizza, if um, the availability of resources is plenty, Right? If you have a lot of resources, um, then there's no reason to compete. There's no reason to fight over the pizza. If, however, resources become limited because more people showed up than you invited, right? than you were expecting. Okay? Um, at first, um, maybe this can re or so uh, <laughs> a couple of different things can happen. Um, you, there are two different options here. Sorry. Oh my gosh. A <laughs> um, couple different ways this can go. Scramble competition um, is when essentially we start cutting the pieces into smaller and smaller pieces. So everybody takes the hit. Everybody gets a tiny little piece of the pizza, right? So everyone gets something, but nobody gets enough. Right? And so this is kind of what the wildebeest do. Um, you know, nobody is like fighting other wildebeests away from, you know, a patch of grass or anything. Like everybody is eating as much as they can, but it's never enough in the dry season. Okay. Um, on the other hand, there is contest competition. And so this is where you kind of fight for having enough. Um, and so there are clear winners and losers. Some organisms are going to have plenty and other organisms aren't going to have enough at all. And so winners are going to be healthy and losers might die off. And so we kind of saw this um, with COVID, with the whole toilet paper situation, right? We could have all elected for scramble competition, right? We could have all bought a single roll of toilet paper and it would have been fine. We could have stretched it out a little bit, right? More, you know, napkins from McDonald's or whatever, right? We all could have reduced a little bit but that's not really what happened, right? Instead, we had contest competition where, you know, a few winners, um, supposedly winners, got tons of toilet paper and then so many people didn't get any toilet paper. Um, and so scramble competition is everyone takes the hit, contest is um, there are winners and there are losers. Um, so um, in scramble competition, everyone can, um, risk dying off. So this can actually lead to extinction. Um, you know, if resources continue to be limited. Um, on the other hand, in contest competition, generally the species is more prone to survive, but um, with a genetic bottleneck. So only um, with a few individuals continuing. Um, a lot of times uh, more of a contest competition is seen in uh, territorial animals, right? So your book, uh, emphasizes that there's a difference between home range, right? Like where can the animal live versus territory, which is 
where an animal is actively defending an area and preventing anybody else from foraging within um, the, conf the confines of that territory. Um, and so something like a mountain lion here is an aggressive, aggressively territorial animal. No other mountain lions can come into this space. And so therefore this mountain lion has all of the resources available and you know, everyone else can you know, get lost. Um, competition can also be classified as interference or exploitation uh, competition. Um, so interference is where you are actively preventing other organisms from taking your stuff, right? So you are interfering with their success. Um, so this is um, like territoriality. The mountain lion isn't going to let anybody else in. He is literally interfering with anybody else's ability to come in and forage from his spot. Um, birds can become territorial as well. Um, plants can also. Um, so what this image is showing up here is that um, there are limited resources in an area. And so this plant is going to release allelochemicals into the soil. And neighboring plants are going to take up those allelochemicals and they're going to die as a result. And so this is um, thinning, <laughs> um, thinning the population in such a way that um, this individual is interfering with this one's access to nutrients literally by killing it. That's right? so kind of wild there. Um, the other option is exploitation. And so this is essentially you take the resource and no one else can have it, right? You're not preventing anyone else from having it. You are eating it up so that no one else can have it, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, an example is a tree taking water up from the soil, right? Water, nutrients, whatever. Um, and so there's less available for the neighboring plants, right? So releasing the chemicals is interference. Taking up nutrients and water is exploitation. So multiple possibilities, um, multiple practices within the same organism. Um, also, uh, this from Finding Nemo, right? There's Dora's little fin. Um, lots of competition, right? In these gulls, there is a very high population density. Resources are not available for all of them. And so we start to see competition. And so if one of these birds gets the crab, which we know he doesn't, but if one of these birds gets the crab, he is um, practicing exploitation competition because he is preventing others from having this resource by gobbling it up himself. Um, okay, so competition, right? It can be pretty brutal world out there. Organisms have to compete for limited resources. Um, in addition to resource limitations, density itself is pretty stressful. <laughs> um, so if you've lived in a city or, you know, maybe even crowded into a dorm or whatever, maybe you, um, you know, realize just, you know, how stressful being around so many other individuals within your species can be. Um, and so um, in the wild and in humans, whatever, there are um, increased aggressive or antagonistic interactions the more individuals there are. So at higher densities, you're crammed together more. And so you start to fight a little bit more. Um, and so this is stressful, okay? Um, the stress of these in, uh, additional antagonistic interactions can increase cortisol levels um, or cortisol in humans, um, hydrocortisone um, or other, um, other hormones and other animals, but essentially your stress hormones are increased. Um, and these are going to um, actually suppress growth, right? Um, they, so by suppressing growth, this essentially makes it uh, take a longer amount of time to re reach a reproductive size, okay? Um, it might prevent you from being healthy enough to reproduce, okay? Um, might delay sexual activity because you are too busy looking for um, resources and trying to get away from other organisms. Um, the immune system can be suppressed by the stress itself. Um, and so this makes individuals more susceptible to um, disease. Okay? So there might be increased mortality because of a suppression of the immune system. Um, increased fetal mortality, right? If, um, if you're around so many others and you are competing for resources, um, 
you know, these uh, offspring might not be born as healthy as they otherwise would. And so there'd be a higher mortality rate, um, reduced lactation again because of malnutrition. Okay. Um, this image from your book shows um, that as population density increases, so high population, low population, um, that's actually going to increase the mean age of first reproduction. So in other words, if there are more seals in the population, they are much more densely packed it's going to take the seals longer to have their first, um, their first pup. Um, also, um, population two years and older from the previous year. Okay, so increased population, smaller population, um, and mature females giving birth. Um, so, and this is a percentage. So where there's a small population, almost all of the females are giving birth. Um, when there's a very large population, a very low number of those females within the population are giving birth. And so um, the effects of stress occur at the individual level, right? Like natural selection occurs on the individual, but then this radiates out throughout the entire population. If it's happening to all of these individuals at once, it ultimately is going to in, um, influence the entire population. So overall, this high density situation is going to lead to decreased fecundity. Um, so I want to emphasize that there's a difference between fecundity and fertility. Um, fecundity is essentially the potential for um, producing offspring, right? So it's the number of gametes one can produce. Um, and then fertility is um, you know, the, the number that are actually produced. So decreased fecundity, the potential for uh, producing offspring is decreased, um, therefore a decreased birth rate, um, and um, an increased mortality rate because of the additional stress, because of the reduction in resources. Okay. Um, as I was just saying, um, this competition also affects growth and development, right? and that part of that is because of stress, um, part of it is because of reduced uh, resources available for all. Um, this doesn't just happen in animals, it happens in plants as well. And so your book uh, explains a study on um, salt marsh plants. Um, essentially, these uh, scientists grew these plants at varying densities. Um, so in one pot, you know, there were five plants, another pot, there were 10 plants, 15 and 20 plants. Um, so ultimately, um, they looked at how healthy the plants were. So here is low density plants and here is high density plants. Um, and so um, with a higher density, there is less light available for individual plants. And so when they looked um, at the weight of the plant, what they saw is that plants are smaller in high density situations than they are in low density situations, right? There's kind of less room to spread out. There was also a 70% reduction in leaf area. So not only are the plants smaller, but also um, the leaves themselves are smaller. Okay. Um, photosynthesis was reduced by about half. And of course, this is tied to the mean leaf area, but um, they were able to get less light right? because they were more densely packed. Um, and the one, uh, the one factor they measured that looks different is the leaf area ratio. And so um, essentially this increase in leaf area ratio as the density increases, essentially what that indicates is that the plants are kind of um, reallocating resources from the rest of the plant to produce leaves as much as possible. So this is costing the plant energy and resources because um, you know, the plant is just trying to survive um, in any way possible, and so it reallocates uh, the resources into the leaves. Okay, so as we can see, the denser the population is, the physical, the organisms themselves are going to be affected. Um, and so because of these density dependent effects, a lot of organisms have the ability to self-thin. Um, and so essentially this is individuals are going to die out in a densely populated area to allow some individuals to be really successful. Um, and so um, what we can see uh, up here is that 
uh, you know, on the y-axis, we have surviving plants, right? At the beginning of the season, the plants were super dense. And over the course of the season, the density declined, right? So certain plants were actually dying off and the surviving plants, they were actually able to increase in size because now there's more space, more resources, including light are available um, to the remaining plants. Okay. Um, another way of looking at this um, density of surviving plants. Okay. So we started out with a lot of plants over the season, the number of plants declined. So December to January to April, et cetera. Um, and those surviving plants increased in weight. Okay. So the survivors are going to benefit from this self thinning process. Um, and so it's easy to think about this in plants. This is also the case in um, other kinds of sessile animals, um, such as barnacles and mussels. Um, you know, just being too close together um, is going to make it so nobody can survive. Okay. Um, so that would be more like a scramble kind of a competition. So no one would survive in that case. And so um, instead, these organisms elect for more of um, uh, <laughs> uh, so the, these organisms elect for there to be winners and losers, right? So self-thinning is essentially creating the losers. Okay. Um, a form of, or another form of um, density dependent regulation um, kind of feels like an anomaly, right? So um, when we think about um, population growth, in general, we think of small population means there's a ton of resources available for each and every individual, right? So every person has their own pizza, right? So population should be able to explode and be so very uh, big and healthy. Um, so small populations usually grow really fast. Um, however, there are some exceptions. Um, in populations that get, that get too small, sometimes the rate, um, the birth rate, the growth rate is decreased so much that the population can't grow at all. Um, and so what we can see here um, is, for example, a sea slug. Um, sea slugs, of course, are really slow. They're slugs. They just kind of crawl along the ocean floor. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, if there are too few individuals within the population, so they're crawling along, they may never encounter somebody with whom to reproduce. And so um, if the population is small enough, this cute little fluffy sea sheep here um, might never get a date and therefore might not be able to reproduce. Um, so sea slugs in particular um, try to uh, accommodate or, or try to take advantage of any time they do happen to come across um, someone else from their own species, uh, they are hermaphroditic. Uh, and so anytime these guys encounter someone else from their own species, they don't want to have to risk like, oh, I'm a male and you're a male, therefore we can't reproduce. No, 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 they actually have both. And so both um, are going to be fertilized by the other sperm. Okay. Uh, so this doubles the reproductive capability um, of the species. Okay. So take a message with those guys is that um, if the population is small enough, right, there's only 10 individuals within a very large space, chances are they're never going to walk past each other and never have the opportunity to reproduce. Um, same kind of an issue with endangered species. So these lemurs here at the bottom, um, if their populations drop low enough, they aren't going to be able to um, have a birth rate that exceeds the death rate. Okay, so very important to keep um, populations above this rate. Um, so in this graph, we can see um, birth rate increases right up to a certain point, right? Like we would expect if there's lots of resources available. But if we have too small of a population, the mortality rate actually exceeds the birth rate. So that is called A. Okay. Um, in general, this seemingly seeming reversal of um, uh, these density dependence effects is called the Ali effect.
So as we've seen in all of these different examples of density dependent regulatory factors, um, the population death rate and the population birth rate can both be affected by these different types of factors. Right? So we can affect the number of births by changing um, you know, the time it takes to reach reproductive health right, and age. Um, we can affect the mortality rate by affecting the resources and the stress and everything else. Um, and so both density dependent mortality and density dependent fecundity can be affected by the factors that I've just discussed. Um, we can look at some different scenarios here. Um, what we can see is time and the rate of births and the mortality rate in red. Okay. Um, these are all kind of hypothetical scenarios here, but it is possible for um, a density dependent factor to affect the mortality rate, right? So as um, the population gets larger, um, the mortality rate is going to increase, right? Even if the birth rate stays the same. Similarly, the mortality rate may be the same, but as population size, um, which I might've called the x-axis time, I meant to say population size, which is right down here. I apologize for that. Oh my goodness. Um, in some circumstances, mortality rate can be pretty constant, but as you get a larger and larger population size, like we saw in those seals, the birth rate is going to decline. Um, and what is probably the most common is that as population increases, the number or the birth rate, right, per capita birth rate, number of individuals, one specific individual in the population can produce, the birth rate goes down and the mortality rate goes up. And okay, so a lot of different possibilities, um, all density dependent. Okay, so these are the biotic factors. Okay. Um, in each of these graphs, regardless of the slope of the birth rate and the death rate, we can see that um, when birth rate equals the mortality rate, Right, so when the number of new individuals equals the number of individuals that are leaving the population via death, um, this is the maximum population that is sustainable. Right, so you are replacing all of the lost individuals from the previous period of time. Um, and so this point, right, this intersection between the birth rate and the death rate, is called K, the carrying capacity of the current environment. Of course, if the environment changes the carrying capacity will also change. Right? So the current um, maximum sustainable population is K, which is expressed in number of individuals. So the last time I showed you this simulation, we were talking about exponential growth, right? the wildebeests um, from uh, you know, 1960 or so to 1978 or so um, increased exponentially, right? But we know um, just logically um, that it's impossible for any population to continue increasing like this indefinitely. And so what is more realistic is that these density dependent factors are going to limit the population by changing birth and death rates. Okay? Um, and instead of having this indefinite exponential curve. Instead, what we see is the carrying capacity K is the maximum population that can exist within the current climate conditions, the current um, physical conditions. Um, and so the population growth is actually going to slow down as you get closer and closer to the carrying capacity. Okay, um, And so in the exponential, we looked at the population growth rate, the DNDT, how many individuals are added to the population within every period of time. Okay, um, And that actually continued to increase. Right, the, the growth increased every year. In the logistic 
growth model, which is what we are going, what we are talking about now, where the carrying capacity is considered, what we see is that at first, when resources are plentiful, right? So you are well below the carrying capacity. When resources are plentiful, the population growth rate is pretty big, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So in the beginning, the growth is more or less exponential. But then what we see is that there is a point at which the population growth stops growing, right? So you're not growing anymore. Instead, the growth rate, right? so how much, how many individuals are added to the population every year actually starts to go down, right? So what this means is that as you approach the carrying capacity or the limit in this um, graph here, as you approach the carrying capacity, essentially the population growth is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so ultimately the sustainable population where birth rate equals death rate is going to be approximately the same as the carrying capacity. And so again, um, there is a point where we go from an increase in population growth rate to a decrease in population growth rate. Not that the population isn't growing anymore, it's just slowing down a little bit. This is different than the exponential growth where the growth rate continues to get bigger and bigger indefinitely. So let's add some terms here before we do a little bit of math. Um, ultimately, as the population size n gets close to k, the carrying capacity, the population growth is going to decrease. Okay, so that's this part of the curve here. Um, in the beginning, the population growth, when resources are plentiful and you are nowhere near your carrying capacity, the population growth is more or less exponential, right? So that's what we would expect. That's why the Lee effect is just so weird, okay? Um, at about half of the carrying capacity, so carrying capacity over two, half of the carrying capacity, this is when the change in growth rate, DNDT, is going to go from positive, okay, negative. Right, so it is going to decline as the population size approaches K. Okay. This point, right, half of carrying capacity is called the inflection point. And okay. so that's going to be important in our um, calculations here in just a moment. Okay. So we know now that the maximum growth rate, right, the largest DNDT, um, is going to be half of carrying capacity, okay? So the maximum growth rate is going to occur when the size of the population N is half of the carrying capacity. Right, so this is essentially one half times k. Okay. Okay, so that's the maximum growth rate. Um, that is something that I could ask you for. Okay, and that is important in logistic growth. Okay, so I'm trying to color code this a little bit to um, help you to see the differences in the different equations, as, equations that you're going to use. Now, in our exponential modeling, we said that the population growth rate was equal to the maximum growth rate times the population size. That is the case, but we also know now that that DNDT is going to get smaller and smaller as 
the population approaches k. And so we add an additional component to that same equation. Okay, so we're going to start with the same exponential equation, dndt, the growth rate of the entire population is equal to the per capita uh, per capita growth rate, okay, so R max times whatever the population size is times one minus the current population size over the carrying capacity. Okay, so this here is the additional factor. This is what um, essentially um, slows down this growth as the population approaches carrying capacity. So this is what is unique to logistic, and this incorporates the carrying capacity. Okay. So let's go back to that mouse population scenario. Okay. Remember that in the mouse population, Um, I told you that the beginning population was 2,000 mice. Okay. Also, from our previous math, right, just to emphasize here, our previous math, we calculated that the per capita growth rate R, or R max, is 0. 0.4. Okay, so R is. 0.4. Now, I want to actually make this population a little bit more realistic. We will, and that we will look at it as a logistic model, which means that there must be a K. On an exam, I will tell you what K is. In this case, we're going to say that this particular um, environment can support 10,000 mice. Okay. So in the first month that this population is in, or in the first month that we're measuring this population, the DNDT, so the number of new individuals that are added to this population is going to be equal to R max 0 0.4 okay, times the initial population 2000 okay, times one minus the initial population size 2000. Oh, and I'm running out of space. Um, over the carrying capacity, over 10,000. Okay. So what we can do here is multiply 0.4 times 2,000 times 1 minus 2,000 over 10,000. Okay. That should give us 640 mice have been added to the population after the first month. Okay. The second month, let's try another one. The growth rate is the same, so 0 0.4. Now the initial population at the beginning of this month is last month's population plus the new mice. So 2640 times 1 minus 2640 over the carrying capacity is the same. Okay. Type this into the calculator. You get 777.216. So we'll say 777 mice are added to the population. Okay. Now, we can see that the growth rate is actually increasing. 
Okay. So the number of individuals that are added to the population is getting bigger and bigger and bigger in this first part of the curve. Okay. So this is more or less exponential growth. What, uh, what is the maximum growth rate of the population? Okay. Well, the maximum growth rate of the population should be at this point right here. Okay, we can see the slope of the curve changes at this point. So k over 2, right? the number, or I guess I should ask, um, yeah, what is the maximum growth rate? Um, that would be k over 2. So 10,000 over 2 is 5,000 mice um, per month, right? which is absolutely outrageous. Okay, so let's pick a population somewhere over here. Okay, so what about, oops, sorry, 5,000 mice is the maximum or is the population at which we have the maximum growth rate. To figure out the actual growth rate, we need to plug it into this equation, right? We, that is the DNDT. Okay. So when there are 5,000 mice, five thousand over 10,000, ultimately, that means that we are adding an additional 1,000 mice to the population within a single month. All right, that seems more like it. Sorry about that. Um, so again, if we want to know what is the maximum growth rate of the population, we first have to figure out the population size at which the maximum growth rate is exhibited. So first find N, which is half of K. This N then gets plugged into the same equation we've been using up here. And of course, this one is the big important one for logistic growth. Okay. And so ultimately, the DNDT right, uh, growth rate is going to be a thousand mice. So that would be the answer to the maximum growth rate of the population. Okay, so what happens if we look at the population up here somewhere, right? So above this maximum growth rate. Let's say the population is 6,000 individuals, right? So after this first month or this month, after the most, the highest growth rate month, 6,000 over 10,000. And so the maximum or the growth rate would be 960 mice are added in that particular month. One more example here to play with this equation. What happens if we go above carrying capacity? All right, so what happens if the population exceeds K? All right, so I will say that the, um, the population size is 10,500 mice. All right. K is only 10,000 mice. So when we plug this into our equation, 10,500 is our N times one minus 10,500 over 10,000, right? N and K, what we get is a negative number, okay? And that's not a mistake, right? That is because this number is bigger than this number, okay? And so what the negative indicates is that the population has been 
um, reduced by 210 mice. All right, and so um, what that indicates to us is that um, sometimes the population can actually exceed carrying capacity. Right? So the population might in actuality go above K, but what's going to happen very soon thereafter is that it's going to decline again and it might kind of oscillate around carrying capacity in real life, right? Not this, you know, lovely little um, hypothetical curve here, but in real life, it oscillates around carrying capacity, sometimes going a little over, sometimes a little bit under, but in general, this is the sustainable population size, okay? So to summarize, um, when we consider carrying capacity, we use these two equations. Okay. When we consider continuous growth, also called exponential growth, we can look at the population growth rate, okay, DNDT. We can predict the size of a population and we can predict how long it's going to take to double or triple or quadruple the population. If we have one of those rare situations where there is a discrete situation, okay, so very predictable seasonal breeding, um, or otherwise if the problem tells you to use a discrete equation, this is the equation that you use. Okay, also all of the equations that we talked about in class the other day. So that concludes today's lesson. Um, thank you guys so much for your patience and understanding. Uh, I encourage you to look for that homework assignment um, and to give um, this math a little bit of practice with that homework or classwork assignment. Um, and then uh, I will see you guys in our next class together. Once again, thank you guys so much.